The Chapel. Written by Kevin Hearn. Narrated by Kevin Collins. Stories are sometimes born in fire, but regardless of origin, they always live around fires and grow in the telling. If bellies are full and the veins pulse with a flagon or two, why then all the better for the story? Sometimes, as a druid, stories are expected of me. People just assume I'm a part-time bard as well. Atticus, tell us a tale we haven't heard before, Oberon said. We were taking a break from training by camping on the Mogollon Rim near Knoll Lake. After cooking fresh trout over our campfire for dinner, we were relaxing with hot cocoa and roasting marshmallows. You want a story, I said aloud. My apprentice couldn't hear my hound yet. She was still four years away from being bound to the earth and practicing magic. To be polite and include her, I sometimes spoke aloud to Oberon by way of inviting her into the conversation. Usually he wants snacks, Granuale said. I'd go for a story, though. It's a nice night for one. Listen to the clever apprentice, Oberon said. All right, what are you in the mood for? I want one where a ne'er-do-well wolfhound meets the fluffy poodle of his dreams and they take a magic carpet ride to sing perfectly orchestrated duets until they land in a field of heather and there's a man there who looks like Uncle Jesse from the Dukes of Hazard and another man who looks like Hank Williams Jr. who says he's got a pig in the ground and... Granuale didn't hear any of that, so she spoke over him and offered her own suggestion. I want a story where you took part in an historical event, a famous one. All right. I paused to think and plucked a gooey marshmallow off a steel stake before answering, How about the quest for the Holy Grail? Nuh-uh. No way, my apprentice said. You weren't a knight of the round table. No, absolutely not, I agreed. But the Grail legends didn't start out as highly Christianized tales about Arthur and Lancelot and so on. They were based on the adventures of one man, a druid, as it happens. And then that story got changed, the way stories do, in the telling and retelling of it around hearth fires and campfires like this one. Granuale crossed her arms. So you not only know the original story of the Grail, you're telling me you actually found it? Yes, it was my quest. She still thought I was bluffing. Who gave you the quest? Okma, of the Tuaha de Danan. All right, fine. And what was the Grail? I mean, it couldn't have been the cup at the Last Supper or anything, right? No, that whole business with Joseph of Arimathea and the Cup of Christ was a later addition. Hell, King Arthur's story was pulled almost entirely out of Geoffrey of Monmouth's ass. There were about 650 years separating the events themselves and the first written account of them that survived to the modern day. Plenty of time to screw everything up and fabricate large portions of it. What the poets eventually called the Grail was Dagda's Cauldron, one of the four treasures of the Tuaha de Danan, which could feed an army and never empty. It was an all-you-could-eat-forever sort of deal. Okay, now that sounds interesting. You went on a quest to steal Dagda's Cauldron, and that got turned into the quest for the Holy Grail? Sort of. Somebody else stole Dagda's cauldron. It was my quest to steal it back. So, who were you? Lancelot? Galahad? No. Stories about those guys got created later. I was the lad who went galloping around the country, telling everyone my name was Gawain. Granuale shook her head in disbelief. Okay, sensei. Let's hear it, she said. 
Make sure you don't leave out what was in the cauldron, Oberon added, and how the dogs got so full they almost exploded. Hey, there are dogs in this story, right? The Tuaha de Danan are loath to put themselves in harm's way when someone else can be harmed in their stead. With this in mind, in 537 A.D., Okma approached me on the far reaches of continental Saxon territory with a task he thought I'd find attractive. It wasn't the first time he had asked for my services. He'd asked me to raid the library at Alexandria once because he'd foreseen its destruction. Some bloody Pictish git has stolen Dagda's cauldron and taken it into the western territory of the Britons, he told me. He was referring to what would eventually become Wales. At this time, the Britons there were just beginning to form their Welsh identity. But he spread some sort of arcane fog across the area, preventing us from divining his precise location and from shifting directly there. We need someone who can go in there and take the cauldron back. And I was your first choice? No, we've sent some others in as well. I noticed the we, but didn't comment. Other druids? Aye, there are few enough of you left, but there were a couple willing to go. Sounds bereft of entertainment or profit to me, I said. Did you not hear me, lad? We can't see into the area and can't shift there. Considering that you've been on the run a good while now, does that not hold some attraction to you? He was hoping I'd jump at any chance to escape the eyes and ears of Angus Ock, the Irish god who wanted me dead. But I shrugged. It sounds like I'm trading a god who wants to kill me for a mad Pict with a giant pair of balls and some magical talent. One's not necessarily better than the other. Okma laughed. Fair enough, but you'll be earning my gratitude on top of it. The Dagda is me brother, you know. I thought I earned your gratitude already for that favor I did you down in Egypt. True, but this would be more gratitude. Unspoken was the certainty that my refusal would mean less gratitude. All right, get me a good horse and a proper kit from Gavnu so that I look like I deserve respect. Shift me as close as you can and point me in the right direction. I'll make up the rest as I go. That a boy, Okma said, and clapped me on the shoulder. I'll see you soon. It was a week before I saw him again, but he had the promised armor from Gavnu and a fine horse for me to ride. There were also provisions for the both of us. I changed happily into my kit, feeling optimistic for the first time in months, and then we shifted through Tir Nanoch to a spot near the old Roman road leading west from Gloucester. It was raining heavily. I'd forgotten the rain here, I said, and you didn't remind me, did you? Okma ignored my complaint and pointed west. Go that way. How far before Angus Ock won't be able to sense my magic or divine my location? Not far at all. You'll sense the change once you pass through it. My advice is to make friends with your horse before you do. I've heard they spook easily in there. What can you tell me about the Pict? Okma shrugged. He's mean and ugly. Right, onward then. Okma wished me well and shifted back to Tir Nanoch, leaving me alone in the rain. The horse snorted and looked at me uncertainly. I approached him calmly and petted his neck, slowly introducing my consciousness to his, so that he would pick up on my emotions and vice versa. What I got in response was much more than that. 
Oh, good, the horse said. You're one of them. I was startled to hear his voice in my head. One of who? One of the humans who can hear me. Where did you learn language? Govnu taught me. It appeared that Okma had taken my request quite literally. He'd not only gotten a kit from Govnu, but the smith god's personal horse. And it was because of this experience that I began to teach my animal companions language from that time forward. I am called Gawain, I said. Do you have a name? Applejack. Quite fond of apples, you know. I don't suppose you have any. I checked the provisions and found a significant store of apples in one of the saddlebags. I removed one and offered it to Applejack. Thanks, he said, taking it from my fingers with his lips and then crunching down. I think we'll get along just fine. Just one more thing. When I smell things that scare me, you have to either kill them or let me run away. Because you heard that guy who brought me here. Since I'm a horse, I spook easily. Deal? Well, it depends on what scares you. I can't commit to a blanket statement like that. What if you get scared by the scent of an attractive woman? I have been reliably informed that there are no attractive women outside of Ireland. If you see one here, then it must be a witch, and you should either kill it or run away. Govnu has trained you very well. He had a lot of apples to secure my attention. I'll bet he did. I threw my leg over Applejack, gathered the reins, and gave him a friendly slap or two on the neck. Let us sally forth, my good horse. Follow the road west, to danger and glory. Are those villages? Danger and glory? No, I was being dramatic. Please stop. That could get us in trouble. Point taken. We plodded forward because one does not trot, canter, or even manage a respectable walk in such weather. In less than a mile, however, the character of the rain changed. Instead of a proper downpour with respectable drops, it became a splattery, aggressive mist that couldn't decide which direction to fall. It whipped me in the face from both directions and did its best to fall into my ears and leap up into my nostrils. It argued with cold, implacable determination that there was no clothing I could wear that would allow me to be even mildly comfortable. And something else happened in terms of pressure. My ears popped. We must be under the fog that Okma had mentioned. The temperature dropped as well, and the trees along the road did not seem to be the sort that would hide a band of merry men. They rather offered a surplus of gloom and rot underneath their canopies. The sky was nothing but a diluted wash of ink, gray, swirling brush strokes of moisture. I felt miserable and unwelcome, and began to wonder if I had made an imprudent decision— Applejack expressed similar sentiments. Repeatedly. We were slowly turning into frozen avatars of anxiety, dreadsickles, doom pops. The forest rustled at nightfall. Growls from predators and shrieks from prey were followed by cracks and wet squelching noises and very loud chewing sounds. I built us a makeshift shelter between two trees, binding fallen branches into a rough roof that bridged the gap and kept off the worst of the rain. Can you just go ahead and build me a stable? Applejack asked. Or how about surrounding us with a nice stockade? This will do just as well, I said, building a fire underneath the roof. I've asked the local elemental to keep the hungry animals at bay. Now all you have to worry about are unnatural predators. Hey, what? What kind of predators? 
Ghosts, witches, goblins, the usual. The usual? Applejack tossed his head and stamped nervously. Goblins are the usual here? Hey, calm down. That puny fire won't protect me from goblins. Have you seen a goblin before, Gawain? Tiny eyes, but large teeth and nostrils. They wear horse-hide leather. Me-hide leather. Let's get out of here. Settle down. There aren't any goblins. I was only joking. Applejack's ears flattened against his head, and he showed me his teeth. You are not funny. Sorry, I know it's spooky out there, but we're not in terrible peril yet. I'm sure that's a few days down the road at least. Still not funny. I got him a couple of apples and a bag of oats to atone for my teasing, and I spent some time brushing him down. I told him the legend of the fine filly Fionach, the white mare of Munster, and that comforted him enough so that we could both get some sleep. Before shaking out my wet blanket, however, I spent a wee bit of time modifying the sole of my right boot. I cut a hole in it so that I would still be able to maintain contact with the earth and draw on its magic— but hopefully it would not be the sort of thing that people would notice, or, failing that, remark upon. The rain stopped sometime during our slumber, but promptly began again in the morning once we emerged from our temporary shelter. It's a conspiracy, Applejack said. They want mold to grow in my ears. Who are they? Them. Usually I'm the paranoid one. Why, you have a sword and opposable thumbs. I can only run away and look delicious to predators. Paranoia is my specialty. I'm guessing you're not Govnu's war horse. Aside from the rain and our collective fears, we had little to complain about that day. In the afternoon, we chanced upon an inn with a stable and decided to call the day's ride early. We weren't in a terrible hurry, and a bit of comfort would be welcome. After I'd put Applejack up in a nice stall with plenty of feed, it occurred to me that I hadn't seen anyone taking the road out of the area— no one had passed me in either direction. Yet the stables were quite nearly full, which meant the inn, called the Silver Stallion, according to the shingle outside, must be packed with travelers. Perhaps they were all waiting for the rain to end? No, that's not what they were doing. I quickly discovered that the reason no one was leaving the area toward Gloucester was that they couldn't. He's another one, a salty old codger said when I walked in the door. Welcome to hell, good sir. I quickly scanned the inn. It didn't look hellish, nor did anyone's body language suggest that they were going to give me hell. The customers simply looked depressed as they lounged at tables and benches with flagons of ale and stared at plates of half-eaten cheeses. Thank you, I replied, keeping my voice low. Why is this hell, though? I missed it. We're condemned to stay here for eternity, the old man explained, and it's certainly not heaven. Medieval logic. You can't leave when you want? Oh, sure you can leave, but you'll be back. Take the road to Gloucester and you'll find yourself right back here. I've gone to Gloucester three times now, only to arrive back at the Silver Sodding Stallion each time. What happens if you keep going west? West? The man practically barked at me. Why'd you want to go that way? The old man's raised voice drew eyes to me. I shrugged and said, I suppose because I'm poorly informed. What's wrong with the road to the west? Bloody awful doings down at the Viking trading post. 
Swansea's, I call it, down there on the Guia Peninsula. But fuck if anyone knows what that means. I laughed along with him at that, even though I knew it meant Svein's Island in Old Norse, which was simply called Norse then. Today, the place is called Swan Sea. How bloody awful are we talking about? I asked. It's a long story, and me tongue is like a slug left out in the sun. Ah, allow me to buy you a drink, then. Kind of you, sir. What's your name? I introduced myself as Gawain, which many people heard, no doubt, especially since I spoke their language with a noticeable accent. Conversation in the dining area was subdued, and people probably noted that my kit marked me as a knight of some means. The old man offered his hand and told me his name was Davit. We bellied up to the bar and I ordered two flagons of mead. I also made inquiries about staying the night and the innkeeper shook his head. No rooms left, not unless you want to stay in the stables. The stables it is, then. Once the old man had slaked the worst of his thirst, he told me merrily of death and ruin in the West. Some daffy picked with his face pierced a hundred times had come into Swansea and bollocked up the entire kingdom, having seen the sun in three months. The rain never lets up, never enough to flood, mind, but nothing ever gets a chance to dry out either. Crops are collapsing from root rot, and you have poxy mushrooms bigger than an ox cock sprouting up all over the place. Cows and sheep are shitting themselves until they die. Am I right? He looked at the innkeeper and nearby patrons for corroboration. A couple of half-hearted grunts set him off again. Pastures of them just spread out in the mud for the sport of crows. The smart people moved out a few months ago when they saw there wouldn't be any fucking food. But it's a hard thing to give up one's land after fighting over it and sweating over it year after year. So did the people who moved earlier get out? They weren't trapped like you? Aye, they made it out. This magic fence he's put up has only been in effect for a month now. Good King Caddock is off praying about it, God bless him, but I don't see what good it's doing when the Pict is sitting there building defences. Bloody sorcerer says he's got his own king there now at Swansea. Begging your pardon, but I've been away for a good while. What kingdom am I in right now? Davit laughed at me, and a few of the patrons listening in joined him. What kingdom, you say? How does a knight not know where he is? I shrugged. I travel a lot. Just came across from the continent not long ago. Borders shift and kings die all the time. Hard to keep track after a while. Well, that's true enough. You're in Glewising. Who is your lord? I don't have a lord, I said, but immediately saw that the assembled men wouldn't accept such a state of existence. I'm looking for one, I added, a righteous one. My last lord was slain by the Saxons. A round of cursing and spitting greeted this revelation, and as an enemy of the Saxons, I was instantly their friend. Someone offered to buy my next drink. How are you surviving if you can't get new supplies in? I asked, shooting a glance at the innkeeper. He scowled and picked up a flagon that needed polishing. 
Lads have been helping out, he said. They go hunting, plenty of game hereabouts, but it's all meat all the time now. That and drink, because I had quite a few kegs in storage. Ran out of flour, so there's no bread. Haven't seen a vegetable in three weeks. That's a sailor's diet, that is, David said. We're going to turn pasty and die weeping if we can't get out of here. Well, what about the Pict? I asked. Isn't he facing the same problem? Oh, no, David said, shaking his head. He's got something special there at his wee little fortress. He's trying to turn it into a proper castle, you know. But bugger that. What I keep hearing is that he has some kind of infinite supply of food. It's a magic graal, you know. Take food from it and more appears. He can feed everyone in his fortress just fine, and plenty of people have joined him to get their three squares a day, you bet. But meanwhile, the land is dying around him, spreading east from the Guia Peninsula and maybe north and west too, I don't know. Haven't heard from anybody out there. So nobody is heading to Swansea anymore? Or even in that direction? Only the evil and the stupid. I raised an eyebrow. The evil? Pagan bastards, druids. There was one in here about seven days ago, and another a couple weeks before that. Tattoos on their arms, you know. That was why I'd asked Okma for a full kit. The time when druids earned respect wherever they walked had passed, and it was getting to the point where we couldn't even walk around freely without harassment or outright violence. I nodded and asked, They went to join the Pict? No, not join him. They thought they could bloody do something about him. I wished them well in that regard, but they haven't come back, and we still can't get to Gloucester. So they've had all the effect of King Caddock's prayers, which is to say, no effect at all. Abruptly, I no longer felt like drinking with those men. They had told me all I needed to know, and nothing would follow except personal questions and the exchange of lies. Blending in with the converted populace wasn't difficult so long as I kept my tattoos hidden, for the rules were simple in the early church of the time. Praise Jesus, and if you ran into anyone who didn't do the same, attack the weak and shun the strong. The social camouflage was easy to maintain, but wearying on the spirit. I thanked the men for their company and excused myself to look after my horse. May the Lord bless and keep them and destroy all evil. I brushed Applejack down and fed him and settled in to wait out the night, resolving to get an early start in the morning. I wanted to strip and dry out my kit, but the necessity of maintaining my Christian facade made that impossible. Whenever someone entered the stables, I knelt and clasped my hands and made a show of prayer. No one interrupted my pious devotion. The rain renewed with a vengeance in the morning, determined to erode my substance away and chap my hide. Big fat drops spanged off my helmet and slapped against my leathers, I kept my head down for most of the time and trusted Applejack to follow the path. After a soggy lunch under the partial shelter of an ash tree, we longed for the dry comfort of the stable at the Silver Stallion. An hour's numbing march after lunch brought a surprise. I wiped rain out of my eyes at one point, and Applejack shook his head to accomplish the same end. Refocusing on the road, I saw a structure ahead that I had missed before. Wait, I said aloud, and Applejack stopped. How did I not see that? You mean that building surrounded by a graveyard? Yeah, that's what I mean. 
It looks like a chapel. The cross on the roof was a bit of a giveaway. It wasn't a cathedral or even a regular meeting house. It was a small gray stone and mortar job put together in such a way as to suggest that the mason had been in a hurry. Tombstones leaned left and right in the sodden earth and completely surrounded the chapel, giving the yard the likeness of stained and broken teeth. It was the most morbid house of worship I'd ever seen. I didn't see it either. Maybe it was camouflaged? I have seen druids do that before. Oh, that's true. That must be what happened. There must be another druid around here somewhere, and that's good. Nothing smells good, though. I smell death. How much? Is this just a vague uneasiness, or do you actually smell rotting flesh through all the rain? I suppose it could be coming from the graveyard, but there's something not right about it. Oh, well, we're just going past, right? No, I think we need to check it out. I think we need to live. Come on, it's just a chapel in the middle of a graveyard. Buried bones can't hurt you. There's probably someone friendly inside. What if that's the lure? It's not a place of refuge. It's a spider's web, Gawain. There's a murderer inside who has a convenient graveyard to bury us in. Have you thought of that? Um, no. Well... You go say hi, then, and I'll stand out here and guard the supplies. I dismounted and fed him an apple before casting camouflage on myself and my kit and drawing Fragarok from its scabbard. A low fence that marked the boundary of the hallowed ground had a single open gate that led into the graveyard and pointed to a narrow path between the graves— once I passed through it, I saw that the door to the chapel was ajar. Candles could be seen burning inside. I began to think maybe Applejack had the right idea when I saw that the door was ajar because somebody's head on the floor wouldn't let it close. The head was still attached to a body, but it was a dead body with blue, unblinking eyes staring at the doorframe. It didn't look like a member of the clergy. He was wearing a simple tunic of dyed blue cloth. I couldn't tell anything more about him, including the cause of death, without getting closer and perhaps opening the door further to investigate. But there might be someone waiting behind that door. There could also be an archer waiting in ambush behind one of the gravestones. I dismissed that as unlikely almost as soon as I thought of it. Ambushers rarely like to settle in for their long waits in the rain. Whoever killed this man was either long gone or still inside. I was betting the killer was still inside, or else he would have cleaned up the scene a bit. The sound of falling rain prevented me from hearing anything else, but the same noise would disguise my approach. I crept closer until I was on the doorstep and could peer through the opening. I saw a bit more of the body. The right forearm and hand were draped over the man's belly. They were covered with druidic tattoos like mine. I stepped back and considered— the floor of the chapel was stone, and once I entered, I would be cut off from the source of my magic. I was still centuries away from the creation of my bear charm, and our bodies can only store a little magic for a limited time, so I'd be able to walk in there with one spell and maintain it for no more than a couple of minutes before I'd be tapped out. The gamble would be choosing a spell— I tried to reason it out, because druids are not easily killed, but someone had clearly succeeded quite recently. If I went in camouflage, the killer would still see the door opening and might indeed be waiting for just such a signal. Speeding myself up would normally serve me well, but that advantage would be negated if I didn't know from which direction the ambush would come and realized it too late. 
I opted for strength. If something zapped me or attacked after I entered, I would do my best to wrestle myself outside where I could tap into more of the Earth's magic. The dead druid on the floor might have been trying to accomplish the same before he died. I resolved to keep close to the door if I could. You've found a dead body, haven't you? Applejack's voice said in my head. Yes, but... You're going in anyway? Yes. I don't understand why you're in charge when you are incapable of making decisions in your own self-interest. Oh, look, you say, a slain human. Instead of running away from this obviously perilous chapel, I think I'll stick my neck in and see if it gets chopped off. If I die... You have my permission to run away. Hush now, and let me think. Applejack had a point. There was no need for me to go in. Dagda's cauldron wasn't in there. But thanks to the bloody Romans and the spread of monotheism, there were precious few druids left, and I felt obligated to avenge this one, if I could. I paused for a full minute to listen— I heard nothing but the white noise of water on stone. I dissolved my camouflage and whispered a binding that would strengthen my muscles. I drew as much power as I could hold and then kicked the door open, charging in and looking behind it. No one there. I looked up. No one waited to drop on me from the rafters. I crouched and surveyed the rest of the chapel, cautiously sidestepping back toward the open door. It was a single chamber. There was an altar in the back of the chapel, surrounded by candles, and a body rested on it. A second druid, his tattoos clearly visible, and his arms folded over his torso and clutching a sword like a soldier. Hey, lad, I called. Wake up! He didn't move. His chest remained still, bereft of breath. Davids claim that two druids had left the Silver Stallion in recent weeks came back to me. Apparently, they'd both met their end here. But how? I didn't want to be druid number three, and I was operating on too little information. I backed out the door, grabbed the druid lying there by his tunic, and dragged him outside with me for a proper investigation— the chapel was simply too creepy. Someone had lit those candles recently, and I doubted the dead men were responsible. I knelt beside the druid in the rain. He had no visible head wounds, not even bruising. A purpling of the skin low on the right side of his throat, however, made me look for more. On the left side were four more marks— this druid had been choked to death by a single large hand. Perhaps it had been gauntleted, but that hardly mattered. I'm sure the druid hadn't meekly accepted his strangulation. He must have fought back, but it had done him no good. There was enormous strength behind those telltale bruises. My hand trailed up to my neck, and I speculated on how much protection the chainmail would offer against a hand like that. Probably very little. I wondered if the druid on the altar had been killed the same way. It was probably safe to investigate, since the owner of the giant hand was obviously not in the chapel at present. Stepping back inside, I noticed most of the candles around the altar had been snuffed out, presumably by the wind circulating through. The only illumination now came from the pillar of wan light cast by the open door, largely occluded by my own shadow, and a single candle in front of the altar. I was halfway to the altar when the strangeness of it upset me. If the wind had snuffed the candles, the one that was still burning would have been the first one to blow out. So what had put them out? Movement drew my eye to the lower right corner of the altar. A huge, disembodied black hand and forearm crawled toward the final candle using its fingers. 
The hand was an unnatural carbon black, scarred and pitted like volcanic rock. It pinched out the candle with its thumb and forefinger, and then I lost it in my own shadow. It had no trouble finding me, however, as I backstepped. It scrabbled inhumanly fast across the floor and gripped my leg, not to halt my progress, but rather to climb up, one finger at a time. I hurriedly swiped at it with my left hand to knock it off, but it must have been waiting for just such a reaction, for it somehow caught my fingers, spasmed, and flipped itself onto my forearm, now much closer to my throat. It knew which direction that lay, for it immediately began to inch its way up my arm with rope-like finger movements. My panicked brain suggested that I cut off my own arm with Fragerok to prevent the hand's advance. Its enchanted blade would slice through armor as easily as skin. But after my logic had its say in the next fraction of a second, I thought of something else. Fragroy too, I said, pointing my sword at the hand and activating the primary enchantment, which would force the target to tell the truth. But I didn't want to talk to the hand, I wanted the secondary effect, which prevented the target from moving more than a few inches from the point of the sword while under interrogation. Move the point, and you effectively move the target— I directed the point at the floor in front of me, and the hand was yanked magically from my arm and placed under firm control a comfortable distance away. I watched it writhe and struggle to break free of the spell for a few seconds while I caught my breath and tried to slow down my heartbeat. It was too repulsive to bear for long, however, and I began to saw off the digits, starting with the thumb— once disconnected from the palm, they ceased moving. The arm still tried to attack me with all five fingers missing, so I stabbed it through the back of the hand, and it finally slumped inert on the floor. Before I could sigh in relief, the druid on the altar stirred and sat up, vacant eyes swiveling to face me. His feet slapped the cold stone as he advanced, sword raised— his movements lacked grace, and his jaw hung slack. It was evidence, if the hand hadn't provided enough, that I was dealing with a true necromancer, and I'm not ashamed to say I turned and ran out of there, calling for Applejack to meet me at the gate. The other druid was on his feet outside and managed to trip me as I passed. Mud and turf rippled all around. The dead were rising from their graves. A heavy hand closed around my leg. I swung Fragorok behind me, and the grip fell away. I scrambled for purchase in the mud and tore down the path toward the gate as fists erupted from the graves nearby. I told you we should have run, but no, you don't have any horse sense. Yes, well, you might find me more willing to listen from now on. I had to decapitate one of the raised dead at the gate, but otherwise I had fled in time to avoid the crush of them. I looked back from the saddle as Applejack galloped away and saw that the milling creatures did not leave the fenced area around the graveyard. I blinked rain out of my eyes, and when I refocused, the chapel was gone. It was as if it had never been there. I didn't know how I'd convinced anyone it ever existed, for what would I say? My horse saw it too? The rain stopped soon after I left the chapel. The waterlogged landscape abruptly turned into a dried-up wasteland of red rock and pale straw skeletons of plants. Trees like scarecrows scratched at a cloudless blue sky— I looked behind me and saw only more of the same. The verdant, forested path had vanished like the chapel. Which was the illusion? My kit was still damp, and Applejack was thoroughly wet, so I chose to believe the desert was a lie. It didn't feel that way after a few more hours on the trail, however, once I'd completely dried out and started to bake—
a necromancer who was also able to either control weather or my perceptions like this was indeed a formidable opponent. But every step I took confirmed that he was precisely the type of opponent druids were tasked to take down. He was doing serious damage to the environment here, not by polluting or mining or anything conventional, but through magic. The wasteland went on for days. It would have killed anyone who wasn't traveling with a keg of water. I periodically bent down to the earth, asked it to part for me, and water welled up for Applejack and me to drink. Still, I tried to look thirsty when we rode into Swansea. The people there were getting their water from the river Tawe. The markets were unsurprisingly bare of fresh vegetables, though there were some wormy apples here and there. There was plenty of fish to be mongered, but as David had observed, it was a sailor's diet. Except that somewhere in the fortress they had Dagda's cauldron, the Graal. There was an upper limit to the number of people it could feed. At some point there was only so much food that could be scooped from a magical container per day. But the Pict's plan was becoming clear. With a nearly impassable desert surrounding Swansea and no land nearby to pillage, an army was going to have a tough time getting here, and laying siege would do them no good when he could feed his people in the keep indefinitely with Dagda's cauldron. The keep wasn't complete yet, but it was taking shape, and the walls of the fortress looked like they had been shored up and thickened. It sat upon the river's edge, and there was no doubt a well inside that afforded them plenty of water. Some judicious inquiries with a fishmonger here and an apothecary there revealed that the captain of the guard was looking for a few good knights to join the crew. You look like you could dish out a good fawning, the apothecary said as he measured out some herbs that I would use for purposes beyond his ken. He squinted at me, sideways. The pay is good, and so is the food, I hear. The Fisher King is generous to his subjects, even though he be plagued by some terrible pestilence. The Fisher King? Aye, quite an upstanding chap as far as kings go. The blood he picked on his elbow is a nightmare, but thank the tits of all the saints, he's not in charge. Where can I find the captain? Inquire at the fortress first, he said, but check the pubs along the docks if you don't find him there. I checked along the docks first, primarily to give myself cover. I wanted the captain to think I arrived by sea rather than braved the wasteland. After picking a suitable ship, it was a busy port, I searched for a stable to house Apple Jack. If I'd come across to Swansea on ship, it would be unlikely for me to arrive on horseback. In Applejack's assigned stall, I knelt down and touched the earth with my hand and made contact with the local elemental. It was understandably distraught at what had been happening in the area and relieved that a druid had finally made it far enough to possibly address the problem. I asked for its help. I'd been thinking of how I could access magic for a longer period of time when cut off from the earth. Could it charge up a stone or gem, perhaps, with enough magical energy that I could still craft a few bindings? Not stone, it said. Metal, silver or gold, stores magic best. Gratitude, I replied. Query, craft silver storage talisman for me? Affirmative. Contact with skin required. After some additional back and forth, a rough silver cross pushed up from the earth into my hand, imbued with enough magic for several spells. Social camouflage again. If I cast any magic, it would be seen as a miracle performed by the Christian god. 
all I had to do was whip out the cross and give praise for my deliverance. I stowed it in a belt pouch for easy access. Four men-at-arms challenged me at the gate to the Swansea Fortress, the soon-to-be castle. The captain was in attendance, a middle-aged veteran with more salt than pepper in his beard. He saw me as a threat at first, since my armor was better than his, but once I humbly begged leave to join the guard, follow his lead, and serve his lord, he relaxed somewhat. Why are you here, he said. I came in on the last ship from the Frankish lands. Fine, but why sail to Swansea, boy? I never get tired of being called boy by men who are hundreds of years younger than I am. I heard about the Fisher King across the channel, kind and generous and yet invincible. You heard about the Fisher King across the channel. Come with me. I think he would be very interested to hear the details. He led me through the gates and into the fortress, past halls hanging with tapestries and maids keeping the stone swept. It's near time for the evening meal, the captain said. I'm sure they can find a place for you at the table. Always enough food to go around, of course. The Great Hall was a festival of tapestries and seven-branched candelabras. Long tables with simple benches were placed end to end on one side. The other side was curiously bare, and everyone sat facing the blank space, which I began to suspect would be the scene of some entertainment forthwith. The middle table was furnished with high-backed chairs rather than benches, and there sat a pale man with heavy-lidded eyes dressed in luxurious furs. A huge golden cross dangled about his neck, and a simple golden circlet rested on his head. He seemed uninterested in the food before him. To his left sat a couple of noblemen, and to his right sat a man who could be none other than the Pict. The entire right half of his face was covered in tattoos that undoubtedly served a magical function, just as mine did. Perhaps thirty silver bars pierced his face on the same side. He must have heard about silver's magical properties as well, so I could expect him to be fairly juiced. Still, I wasn't terribly worried. No one had attempted to take away my sword yet, and that gave me confidence. That and my own silver store of magic. The Pict wore greasy dark hair down to his shoulders, and his beard had been shoved through silver circlets so that it fell like a dark stalactite down to his sternum. It was to him, not the presumed Fisher King, that I was led. Dagda's cauldron sat plainly before him. Serving women were loading up plates as high as they could manage and walking them down the tables to serve guests. Since it was far more food than any one person could eat, a small pack of dogs waited behind them for the bonanza of leavings that would no doubt ensue. And yes, Oberon, there were sausages. Counselor, the captain said, addressing the Pict by what must be his title, this knight has come from the Frankish kingdom, where he says he has heard of the Fisher King— the Pict looked up at me, but the Fisher King did not stir at the mention of his name. Has he now? The Pict's voice was mellifluous and light. I had rather expected something reminiscent of sulfur and bone shards. And you are? he asked me. Sir Gawain, at your service, I replied. Excellent. You can serve me by joining us for dinner— I would like to hear how you heard of the Fisher King in the land of the Franks. He turned to the nobleman to his right. Lord Gwynedd, might you do me the great courtesy of making room for this night? A shuffle of chairs, an additional one produced for me, and I was seated within choking distance of the Pict who'd stolen Dagda's cauldron. 
though I couldn't be absolutely certain that he was also the necromancer that had turned whales into bloody bollocks. He certainly looked the part. The captain excused himself to return to his post. A serving maid placed a heaping plate in front of me and said, Counselor, dinner is served. Ah, thank you. Tis your cue, my liege. The Fisher King roused himself from his stupor and said grace before everyone began to eat. Everyone said amen, and then the Fisher King slumped back in his chair. Is the king not well? I asked. His appetite is a bit off right now, the Pict said. You may call me Domek, he added. Thank you, I replied. Tell me how you came to hear of the Fisher King, he said. I spun him a story of how I had heard of a land wasted, but a castle in the middle of it saved by God because the Fisher King was so faithful. I wanted to serve such a man, and so I came here to offer my sword. A man of faith, are you? Tremendous faith, sir. Let me show you this cross given to me by a lady I saved from the Saxons. I took the silver cross from my pouch and brandished it over my plate. If you say a small prayer each evening, it protects you from the very demons of hell— I spoke the words that would bind my vision to the magical spectrum. It was old Irish, of course, and bloody Domek recognized it. That sounded like the speech of druids, he said, frowning at me. Are you a druid, Sir Gawain? At this point, I'm sure he expected a denial— I actually expected to issue one. Instead, my left arm whipped up and I smashed him in the face with my studded leather bracer. The back of his head hit the chair, stunning him, and I pushed mine back to give myself room and stood. The assembled diners gasped in shock, and some angry exclamations wafted my way. I gave Domek another punch in the mouth to prevent him from speaking a spell and then checked out the Fisher King in my magical sight. He wasn't alive. That explained the loss of appetite. He had plenty of dark spells wrapped around him, however, some of them clearly bound with Domek, and other wisps of smoky malevolence that seemed to radiate in every direction until they disappeared at the walls. Domek was definitely a necromancer. Right, I said, pulling out Fragorok. There wasn't time to analyze the situation with a room full of armed nobles and guards who would shortly be after my head. I made sure the Fisher King lost his first, since he wasn't using it anyway. It was telling that he hadn't moved, even though his most trusted counselor had been whacked in the face twice in close proximity. I swung Fragorok through his neck, and it tumbled onto the table. There was no blood. The shadowy spells around him dissipated. Domek jerked as if I'd hit him again, and the screaming began. I checked my rear to see if anyone approached from that quarter, and found the nobles cowering in a satisfactory manner. The lesser folk and the maids tore at their hair in terror, as they fled the hall. There were guards running my way, however, and I was quite clearly the bad guy from their point of view. No! Domek cried, his eyes fixed on the head of the Fisher King. He was chained to the land! No wonder the land had died out so quickly. Domek had bound it to a dead man. With the Fisher King gone, the land would be able to recover on its own, so long as the Pict didn't do it again. Domek had more than earned the death sentence, according to Druidic law. He'd been draining the life out of an elemental while cloaking his activities beneath a fog. There wasn't a Druid alive who wouldn't slay him for what he'd done, and I felt honored to get to him first.
Unfortunately, he ducked under the swing of my sword and trapped my arm across my body before I could take a backswing. Magic swirled amongst the silver bars in his face, and blood dripped from his ruined nose. His right hand grabbed me between the legs, and then he lifted me bodily over his head, throwing me over the table into the clear space of the hall. Kill him, he demanded, and pointed at me in case the guards hadn't figured out I was a public nuisance. A slim, wee man like him shouldn't have been able to pick me up and toss me. He was using the Earth's energy in the same way a druid would to boost his strength. Except he'd stolen all that energy, leeching it through the Fisher King. The minions in leather boots weren't any trouble. Fishing out the silver cross, I used some of the stored magic in it to bind the leather on the insides of their calves together, and they collapsed to the stone floor. Some landed less gracefully than others. I couldn't do the same to Domek. He had fashioned some kind of ward against my bindings. He couldn't affect me directly with his magic either, since necromancers are incapable of affecting the living except through the dead. I used some of the juice to increase my speed and strength instead and charged him. For all the power he had leached, Domek was still at a disadvantage, and he knew it. He wasn't armed or armored, and there weren't any dead people in the hall he could use for his own ends. He did, however, have some big fucking chairs he could throw at me. I leapt over the first one, but the second knocked me down. He was on top of me before I could regain my feet, his left hand pinning my sword arm to the floor while his right tried to grasp my throat. I prevented that by sweeping my left arm out, dropping the cross, and then I locked onto his neck, a rather skinny one, and began to squeeze with all I had. He could have grabbed me in turn, but instead he clawed at my arm and tried to break my grip. His damned nails ripped at my forearm, and he bruised me, but he wasn't enough of a fighter to know anything about pressure points or how to break bones. That black hand of yours got two druids this way in the chapel, I said through clenched teeth. You know the one I mean, Domek. The wheel keeps turning, doesn't it? He couldn't answer me. I crushed his trachea, and his hands fell slack as the strength left him. I rolled him off me and saw that there was still plenty of magic centered on his head. As a necromancer, he might have rigged his own resurrection, so I removed the picked head and tossed it into the hearth to burn. I didn't need my magical sight anymore, so I dispelled it. More guards streamed into the hall, including the captain, alerted by the panicked dinner guests. The lads on the floor couldn't decide whether to plea for help or to urge their friends to get me. It was time to make my exit, so I picked up the silver cross and hurried to the nobles' table. Dogs had leapt on the tables to chow down since the humans had left all that perfectly good food there to cool. One of them was feeding directly from Dagda's cauldron and couldn't believe his good fortune. He snapped at my arm when I tried to take the cauldron, but discovered that his teeth didn't fare well against chainmail. Go on, you're full, I said, and he allowed me to take the cauldron without any more fuss. I upended it to turn off the infinite refill, and then camouflaged it, my kit, and myself with the remainder of the magic stored in my cross. I sheathed Fragorok as the dismayed shouts of the guards echoed in the hall. Carrying the cross in my left hand and the cauldron, or the grail, in my right, I did my best to hurry past them with a minimum of noise. It's tough to sneak around in armor, but they were helping me out by loudly asking each other where I went. Once out in the unpaved courtyard where I had access to the earth, it was a simple matter to maintain my camouflage and slip past the guards at the gate. 
I retrieved Applejack from the stable where I'd left him and set off across the wasteland toward Gloucester. Weather patterns returned to normal, and the elemental was showing the first signs of recovery with the necromancer truly dead. You'd never know today that the area around Swansea had been a desert for a few months. I didn't see the Chapel Perilous, as it came to be known, on my way back. Most of the lads had cleared out of the Silver Stallion by the time of my second visit, and I was able to get a room— there were only three people there, in fact, myself, the innkeeper, and one other, and it was with them that I shared the story of what happened, the quest for the magic Graal. From there, the story was told and retold through the centuries, until poets like Christian de Troyes finally started to write them down. Okma was waiting for me on the trail to Gloucester the next morning— I returned Dagda's cauldron to him, and he thanked me. I told him about Domek and what he'd done, the dead druids at the chapel, and he was grateful that I had dispatched the Pict as well. What would you have of me? Okma said. I owe you some favor for what you've done. I'd like to stay out of Angus Ock's sight for a while, if you can manage it. He gave me a hunk of cold iron and told me to wear it as a talisman. It won't completely shield you from divination, but it will make it more difficult to pinpoint your location. And I've recently linked a new part of the world to Tir Nanuch. Feel like learning a new language? I told him I did. After bidding farewell to Applejack, Okma shifted me east of the Elba River, where the Slavic people were emerging as a distinct culture. And that was how I, as Gawain, came to be immortalized in legend. Granuel dropped her eyes to the fire after I finished and said, Wow! What kind of review is that? Specific praise is always better. So here is mine. I liked the bit where the dogs ate on the table, Oberon said. Thanks, buddy. My apprentice looked up from the fire. Are necromancers common? Quite rare, actually, outside of video games. Domek was one of the worst, but I was able to surprise him. If he'd had time to run the fight his way, I don't think I would have made it. That's where you got the idea for your cold iron amulet, isn't it? Yes, that gave me the idea. The silver cross gave me the idea for the charms, and Applejack is the reason I have a talking hound today. I scratched Oberon behind the ears. Okma did me quite a favor by sending me on that trip. Did you get to try any of the food in Dagda's cauldron on the way back to the Silver Stallion? Of course I did. Well, was it tasty? Meat and potatoes in the most delicious gravy I've ever had, Oberon. I still dream about it. Oh, that's even better than the proverbial pig in the ground. I'm going to go to sleep now and see if I can dream about it too. Good night, Oberon. Good night. That story actually made me a bit hungry, Granuel said. Anybody up for a snack? Oberon leapt to his feet, tail wagging. I meant to say good night after the snack, he explained. I smiled at him. Understood. <laughs>